perhaps the, the place to start is uh, as you end uh, a term, a, a very successful uh, tenure at the World Bank, what, you know, you, you a sense of perhaps legacy, a sense of what have been the areas of greatest accomplishment. We've had, you know, conversations about accountability, transparency, a, a more sort of client approach. If you had to sort of reflect back and look at um, where do you think uh, you have left the mark? Uh, and then we'll turn a little bit to the future after that. Okay. Well, first, Sam, uh, let me thank you. Uh, you, in particular, and Interaction have been a great partner for the bank. I think we've, and for all the people in the audience, um, I was reminded that I think I uh, participated in this forum from London in a video conference a couple of right. years ago. And it's a great forum, and I think you've had, a, as I understand, a very successful uh, three days in terms of covering a wide variety of topics. And from a brief exchange with Sam, I had a sense in some ways what, what you've been discussing is a similar aspect of what I've been trying to do at the bank over the past five years, which is to see how the bank fits into a larger network or ecosystem of, of, uh, of partners and how to leverage and draw from, from one another. And uh, Sam has been uh, extremely helpful in, in many different aspects, so thanks to you. Uh, the, uh, I guess when I reflect on my tenure at the bank, I tend to think of uh, three phases. Um, it's been a busy five years, that's for sure. <laughs> the world economy has been a little bit in, uh, in turmoil. But um, the, the, the first part was the institution uh, faced its own time of troubles, and so there was an internal turnaround that one had to focus on. And as a compliment to the bank staff, uh, my judgment was that the sooner we got people focused on the mission of the bank, that the sooner they would move away from the gossip that occurs in every institution. And, and uh, so I tried to focus people on some core strategic themes, um, and that judgment turned out to be right, which is the reason people come to the bank is they're deeply committed, want to accomplish important things. These are challenging issues, but getting people refocused was an important part. Um, Second, as you know, because we work closely with interaction on this, um, by, I came to the bank in July of 2007. Um, by later that year, we were starting to get some worrisome signs in terms of food prices. Mm -hmm. And I think we also talked at the time, there was an article that had come out in Lancet about nutrition being the underappreciated uh, millennium development goal or sub-goal of one. So we quickly had a sequence of food, fuel, and financial crisis. And it was very important for the bank not only to respond in a big way, but more flexibly, more quickly. Uh, we had about a quarter of a trillion dollars of financial support across all aspects of the bank uh, during that period. But as important as the money was the types of things that we did with Interaction and many others and UN agencies on the, in the food and seeds area um, and the flexible type of support that you need to offer for countries that are frankly treading virgin ground in terms of the challenges that they face. And then the third phase, in a sense, was running throughout, but uh, as we've gotten to the past couple of years, we were able to focus more on it, which is to try to modernize the institution. Uh, one of the themes that I've stressed uh, is the need to modernize multilateralism. Um, I often view things from a historical perspective because I have great love of history. And so I look at the World Bank as one of the Bretton Woods institutions that were created in World War II for one set of functions. Uh, if you think about the issues that people were trying to deal with in that era, which is currencies and exchange rates, reconstruction, development, trade, those issues haven't gone away, although they've been transformed. And so the institutions have to change. And so some people feel that um, you know, you should do away with institutions. I tend to believe more of an institutionalist. I think that they play a critical role as a thin interconnecting tissue among mm -hmm. sovereign states that still make the decisions, but you have to make them better. And so there's a lot of aspects of that modernization agenda. Uh, one was financial, so we've got the first capital increase of the bank in 22 years. Uh, in the area for the 79 poorest states, we have something called IDA. We were able to 
raise about $90 billion, including through reflows for those countries over the past five years. Um, and then uh, a second area is uh, something that I know you feel very strongly about, which is to try to um, open up the institution. And this, we created the first Freedom of Information Act for a multilateral institution. But uh, equally, or if not more important, we've opened up all our data sources, so 7,000 data sets going back to the late 40s, um, and we continue to expand that. So the idea is not only to make it available, but to help develop applications so people may tap into our household survey data that uh, going back and maybe add to it in different aspects. And this is important because um, not only does it uh, sort of force the institution to be open to a variety of voices, but it's part of a larger idea that I've been suggesting about the need to democratize development, move it away from sort of elite economists and universities that say thou shalt do this or that, and instead work with people, everything from the communities to their capitals to try to figure out how they perceive problems and how we can have an interactive process. And this has huge potential, so if you think about it, if you now get on our website, you can find, you can call up a country, find out where all our projects are, get the data on the projects. Before long, we want to be interactive so that somebody with a mobile device in a village can say, well, this is what you think is going on, but here's what we see are going on. So this is transformative in the nature of how one works, and it has an obvious interconnection with civil society because as you think about civil society, um, these are groups that can help you catch corruption. These are groups that can help you assess the performance of social mm -hmm. services. These are groups that can help you determine um, you know, what, what are the priorities of the community. So it's a huge shift from the notion of kind of a big bureaucratic elite institution in Washington to a much more networked system. Um, and then there are other aspects of, of modernization. We're trying to figure out, as you are, how to interact more with different aspects of the private sector, how to draw private capital in, how to connect this with trade agendas, how to integrate the public goods agenda with uh, what are an agenda that's normally focused on countries, so whether it's oceans or climate change or some of the other broader issues, how to interconnect those. And I guess what I would summarize it is to say that uh, what I tried to do at the bank is to focus on uh, developing countries as clients as opposed to objects of policy. So as opposed to saying, you know, uh, here's the development model that, you know, we're going to teach you or show you. The idea is to go to clients and say, let's understand your problems and let's try to figure out what we can bring to bear on those problems, either from our knowledge or increasingly <clears throat> from the experience of other developing countries. So the other change <clears throat> Sam mentioned I was the trade representative in 2001, so over 11 years I've sort of seen this in trade and in finance and in development. The, the extraordinary changes of developing countries on the world economy but on other developing countries mm -hmm. is just something that has moved uh, with uh, extreme rapidity and the system is still adapting to it and we're still adapting to it. Yeah. A rather Im impressive five years during a very difficult, challenging time. But I think it, what was interesting is you gave a, a speech recently at the Pearson Institute on, on an understanding of the roles that you know, societies play in development and uh, both this democratization and so forth. So how did you come to these sort of conclusions of you know, working both beyond the nation state um, and you know, what would be the challenge to civil society to play the most productive role uh, it might play uh, as a partner in this broader development effort? Well, um, my, uh, my background is more um, sort of multidisciplinary. Um, so <clears throat> whether it's history or government or economics or finance or diplomacy or other aspects, um, you know, <clears throat> I sometimes joke that um, political scientists tend to uh, like to come up with structures that will uh, sort of simplify and portray societies. If you approach life through the perspective of a historian, you tend to see the complexities yeah. and the, uh, the gray. And, and so, um, you know, frankly, 
whatever the problem you're dealing with now, whether as a business or as a diplomat or others, uh, we're so far beyond the idea of sort of nation states as billiard balls and you know black boxes that you have to understand the society. So to apply this in the context of development, one of the things I've tried to imbue was to say these are very difficult political economy issues. So if there's a problem and we come up with the best textbook solution but it doesn't work in the political economy, well then it doesn't work and we haven't served the client. So how can we try to understand their institutions, the limitations, the strengths, the weaknesses and bring things to bear? Well, so this immediately opens the door to not only um, the governments that you deal with from the executive branch but it means the parliaments and it certainly means the broader definition of civil society. So, uh, you know, witness what's happened in the Arab world. I mean, you know, so this is a very sharp example of you can have um, certain growth numbers, you can have certain types of performance, but if you don't have inclusive growth, if you don't bring people into the societies, so it, it really runs through everything. And, you know, if you think about most any problem that I've dealt with in any capacity is that if, if you're trying to get something done or to improve it, you have to have your partner own it. Mm -hmm. And so in development, if the, you can bring money, you can bring expertise, you can bring all sorts of things, but if the local people don't own it, it won't work. And so, um, you know, civil society is simply a very broad umbrella phrase to me for different ways in which people participate in their own future. Now, thank you for that. And one of the things that has been interesting to see the, the role that the bank has played or you personally have played as a uh, as an advocate to focus on the world's poor, uh, to focus on change that uh, impacts the broadest possible number of people. You know, since during your, your, your tenure, to what extent have we as a global society been successful in dealing with uh, global poverty issues? And, and, you know, have you got a sense of the bank playing a role, a, a catalyst role within that? Uh, to what extent have we made some strides forward and where do you th think we need to, uh, to uh, really push our efforts? Let, let, me, let me come back to that, but I was just reflecting on, on the question you asked before because it might be interesting to the audience, at least this perspective. Um, you remember, I, I was trade representative in 2001, okay? And so trade is, a, to me, a very fascinating topic because it's both international but it's domestic. And... Um, you know, when I came into the trade representative's office in 2001, there was literally blood on the walls because people were upset about various issues, and so whether it's anti-globalization or whether it's issues of intellectual property rights and pharmaceuticals and others. And, you know, maybe it's both because my experience in a democratic society and governance, but my view has always been it's better to open up and have the dialogue and discourse. So it, I, my own, you know, I have a preference for it being one where people aren't yelling at each other and you know throwing things at each other and you know so I'm a, in that sense I'm sort of a 18th century enlightenment you know but I mean kind of that's yeah. the way I prefer right. to do it but you you take life as it is but you have to and so the more that you show you're willing to discuss and debate but the other side of it and I do this all around the world is you also have to say look if I disagree with you, I get the right to say it too. I don't just yeah. fold. I mean, if I have a different view on the role of energy development or electricity in Africa yeah. or, you know, people who don't want dams under what conditions, okay, but then what about the 30% of people, only 30% of people in sub-Saharan Africa have electricity? How are we going to get them electricity? You know, to have a, a, an analytical and reasoned discourse about this. And I, the reason I emphasize this is that, you know, it's, it's true in diplomacy as well. Um, I was the lead negotiator for uh, the United States at the time of German unification in 1989. And in some ways, that was an interesting example of both statecraft, but kind of the public understanding because what, what our initial read of the situation in late 89 after the Berlin Wall opened was that the people of East Germany wanted what the West Germans had. There was a school of thought at that time called the Third Way, that said, no, no, we're going to create our own separate state. Well, I was in East Germany at the, uh, shortly after the wall opened, and I was visiting Lutheran churches, uh -huh. which uh -huh. played a very important role in terms of the sort of the, um, the, the civil society that such as it could exist in the former German Democratic Republic. But what I could see was is that uh, 
th this was not going to be a merger, it was going to be a takeover because people wanted what West Germany had. Okay? But so it was an understanding then the whole momentum over the next 11 months was driven by the fact that East Germans were going to come one way or the other. And so understanding societies, understanding the messaging, you know, so even if you're a diplomat in the State Department is critically important and certainly if you're in the world of development or trade or others. So I underscore this because um, to me, you know, now this is, it's like so normal, it's obvious, right. okay? Um, and that how, how people will engage. And then of course, and you've all been part of this, is, is that how civil societies engage. Right. And one has to recognize, you know, some of them will be advocates. Some of them will be participants. Some of them, you know, will be, um, you know, opponents and different things. But, but so the world needs room for all of that. Mm -hmm. and, and so you have to decide how you will engage with partners in different ways. And, and to come back to this for the bank, you see, this is interesting because the other lesson for development is governance is really important. <laughs> it's not just a question of sort of the formal economics. Well, we, we now have 188 countries because South Sudan just joined. Um, and uh, you got very different governance systems, yeah. okay? They're not all democracies, obviously. But what you can find is, you know, part of my life is finding common ground to make a better good out of it. And what, what you could find is a lot of the countries, even with authoritarian systems, understand the importance of reaching out to their publics and getting the public opinion and having a sense of better um, sort of performance for their schools or their healthcare systems or whatever. So there's a way that you can make better societies as mm -hmm. part of this uh, and, you know, better performance along the way. So all of this fits within sort of the concept to me of kind of the engagement of, of civil society and its richness to say nothing of the fact that that makes for richer societies. I mean, you know, reckon that I come from this from the point of view, again, you know, in a sort of a enlightenment notion is that the state has the role, but in my perfect society, the state's not the all-dominant role. The state is there to be a servant of the public, and so the public is uh, groups that, that organize. Yeah. So then, then you asked about the poverty issue. Um, well, you know, in macro numbers, uh, you know, the, the, the first Millennium Development Goal of cutting poverty in half is one that will be reached, yeah. uh, and it's already been reached before 2015. Um, and, you know, but it's been largely, the big aspect is the performance in China, mm -hmm. uh, but also, um, to a degree, India and some of the others. But we've now seen progress across Sub-Saharan Africa. So in macro numbers, uh, you know, there, there have been some significant achievements. On the other hand, you know, uh, if, you, if you look at the number of people living under $2 a day as opposed to a dollar and a quarter a day, there's still billions and billions of people. now they're starting to get a chance to have some, at, at those levels, the difference is whether it's almost just subsistence or whether you can start to see a better future. And so when we start to get in societies where you start to see that, you know, mothers and fathers can create a better chance for their children to have a better life, um, you know, then, then you start to get into all sorts of takeoff possibilities. Now, having said this, um, when you know, of course, you have to disaggregate in the world. And so one of the other areas that I've tried to put focus on in the bank, and I know many of the people in this room work with, is what Paul Collier popularized as the bottom billion, right. which is actually about a billion and a half people living in societies where you either got conflict or post-conflict, and none of it works. You got, you know, downward spirals of governance uh, failures and leading to economic failures and poverty failures and then leading to more violence. That's an area where I've tried to highlight at the bank, but we're still just beginning, I think, in the starting points of the work there, and there's lots of things the bank and others can improve to do as partners. Um, I think uh, as you think about um, you know, poverty, one of the challenges for the, the world is to recognize that um, poverty is not only an issue of what they associate as, say, the poorest countries, or what right. we have as the 79 uh, IDA countries. Um, that's a form of financial support that people get uh, grants or very term, long-term loans without interest. 70% 70, 70 of the people living under $2 a day are in so-called middle-income countries. You know, so part of the challenge at the bank is how do we work with the so-called middle-income countries that many people in developed countries think are doing pretty well because they read the stories about Indian growth or Chinese growth or something, but they don't recognize there's still a lot of poor people. So how do we try to address that? 
Um, and I think to connect the civil society with this, you know, what the good news is that I think countries throughout are recognizing they don't have money to waste. And so when you are trying to learn more about how to have effective service delivery, um, you know, people have looked at conditional cash transfer models and different safety nets, but obviously the feedback that you get in communities and from civil society is an important dimension of that. So we're a long way from overcoming the poverty issue, but on the other hand, what I try to emphasize to people at the bank is that if overcoming poverty were such an easy thing to do, somebody would have done it a long time ago. This has been with us for a while. Um, but when you look at the strides that, that have been taken, uh, it's impressive and it should motivate us to keep going. No, I think that's a very in interesting frame, and in, in, uh, both in terms of progress and so forth, but this, you know, this broader issue of inclusive growth of, of states that are responsive to the citizenry. You've had a, an interesting uh, innovation, um, this uh, social accountability fund, this, this concept that uh, um, you know, both, you know, you know is, is the world ready for this uh, concept and, and to what extent does, uh, you know, civil society need to, itself need to mature as an actor uh, helping states ultimately because it is a, a country ownership frame uh, meet uh, their poor citizens and also uh, effectively manage uh, their budgets in such a way that we aren't seeing uh, uh, corruption. Yeah, um, well, at one level, just to give you a sense, um, I think I'm trying to remember exact, but this is a rough number. The World Bank probably provides about $600 million a year to civil society groups as part of development. So that's a, but let me give you a practical example. Um, when, we, when we work with the government of Afghanistan on a uh, development of basic preventive health care, our idea is, again, the government has to own it. So one of the dangers is good, People of goodwill go in, they try to develop it, but it's got no connection with the government and society, and when they leave, it dies. Um, so our idea, going back a number of years ago, was to uh, recognize that the health ministry could design something, but it didn't have the capacity. So this basic preventive health services is operated through civil society groups. It's, op it's outsourced, so whether they are international or whether they're domestic or some combination, and it's had a huge effect on infant mortality and maternal health, so it's basic medical services. So, you know, effective societies realize you can, you can in some of the role of civil society groups is in, on the service delivery. But what led to the creation of this fund was the idea that um, I thought that what I'd seen is a number of civil society groups played a particularly important role on the social accountability side trying to understand the performance, help us with anti-corruption, trying to understand better the service delivery aspect. Um, and you would combine this with transparency. So again, one of my sort of little stories is that, you know, I learned of one education project where someone had the idea of simply putting on the door of the school and the community that this project was supposed to provide, you know, 100 textbooks and two teachers and you know, only 50 textbooks showed up and one teacher showed up. Well, then you get the community engaging to say, well, where's the rest of this? And so, so how you can combine transparency, interaction with a more vibrant community and civil society. So um, again, going back to the history of the World Bank group, we had an arm that was originally set up in 1944 to help with the reconstruction of Europe and Japan, then developing countries. In the 50s, we deal IFC, which is our private sector arm, private sector profit-making arm. Then you've got IDA for the poorest, which came up in the 60s. And so my thought was, in a way, we need something to further support and sort of fund civil society working on these social accountability issues. Now, this is not a slam dunk uh, because, you know, again, if you believe in the separation of state and civil society, I'm always a little wary of public financing or government financing of groups because do they maintain their independence? So working with Interaction and others, we spent a lot of time talking to groups to say, how could we do this in a way that helps fund some of these organizations, helps them contribute to better societies and accountability, maintains independence, has high standards, um, and that's what we're uh, launching. Um, and it also is a subject of some sensitivity with our board of directors, you mm -hmm. know, 25 members covering these uh, 188 countries because they're worried, well, you know, are we creating and sponsoring groups that are going to attack the government? That isn't too popular if you're a government official. 
So um, what we agreed to is to start by with countries that are willing to, to support this experiment, see the benefit, and as in a lot of things in life, I hope that that will demonstrate its benefits for others. And what's interesting, again, even non-democratic countries can see the benefit of this in their support. And a country like Tunisia that has gone through, you know, and still in the midst of a revolutionary period, they've been very supportive about, um, you know, their information acts, their auditing acts, their openness. And so when we give them budget support, it includes legislative changes to kind of drive this forward. But I guess the last point is, you know, uh, you can't take anything for granted. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned at our recent spring meetings, when we met with a number of uh, civil society groups, you know, if people think this is important, then you should speak up about it too, because it's not so easy to always convince the board members to support this. So we'll get it going. We'll get initial support of, I think, about $20 million over four years. Um, but we're also talking with foundations. I understood you had a brunt foundation to some of the foundations I think are interested in this and can support it in this context and other contexts. So, you know, I guess one of the other lessons from the bank, but more generally, is you got to build in feedback loops. You know, nobody's got the perfect idea that solves all problems all at once. That shouldn't be an excuse for stasis, but in other words, learn and, and try to use a transparent system to figure out how to improve what you're doing. So you now had, you know, obviously five years, uh, going on five years of experience uh, at the helm of the bank, and, and you've got your, uh, both the stakeholders in terms of, of governments and, and clients, uh, and you've had to sort of, you know, write a letter to, uh, you know, Dr. Kim as he comes in and say, you know, here, here are some core things that, uh, uh, you know, that I've learned uh, that uh, both in terms of, of not only keeping the bank relevant, but keeping the World Bank Group at the forefront of the role it plays as this premier multilateral institutions. What, you know, what, what, would you, what would you put in that? Well, I spent about three hours with Dr. Kim yesterday, so I'm not sure I can condense it into yeah. a letter. But, um, but uh, and by the way, I think you, the bank is very fortunate. He's obviously a highly intelligent, highly accomplished, um, very committed individual. Um, and part of the way I'm gonna answer the question is, um, I, I, I resist the idea of telling your successor what yep. to do yep. because yep. I think that's their job. And I, this is something else that um, kind of it fits a broader civil society notion. I think change is good. It's good for me, it's good for the institution. He'll bring in things that I don't know. I have things maybe he has less experience with. So I'm, that's the starting point. But within that constraint, I'll, I'll say that um, a couple of things, one, this simple focus on the client is very important. And it may seem obvious, you know, if you think, well, aren't you there to serve? But let me just give you an example. In the course of the debate about my successor, there were some people who devoted themselves to development, but in my view, they were repeating the mistakes of 20 or 30 years ago where they said, ah, you know, we know the answer and developing countries should just focus on one, two, three. Okay, and that to me is the elite top-down model that's not going to work. And so frankly, I, I was somewhat disappointed that these people don't recognize that the way that the bank operates is to say, look, what do you think the problems are? And what have we learned from other countries about how to address those? And by the way, here's some things that we think are kind of over the horizon. You know, so let's take safety nets. You know, I, the one of the lessons of the financial crisis in East Asia and Latin America in the 90s was macroeconomic stabilization isn't enough. If you don't you know, get basic nutrition, you can lose a generation. If you don't get kids in school, you can lose a generation. Now, the good thing is, starting in Mexico and then Brazil, they developed these conditional cash transfer programs, Opportunatus and Bolsa Familia, that um, for a half of 1% of GDP, which certainly would make me envious if I look at US budgets, you know, they're able to deal with 15 to 20% of the bottom of the population, and they connect the money with uh, requiring kids to go to school and get basic health checkups. So we've probably done more for women's health than anything in the history of Mexico. At the same time, we also learn lessons. Like, for example, um, in the study in Brazil showed if you give money to the woman head of household, you get much better use in the community than if it's the men. And in Brazil and now Mexico, we're trying to, they're, they're trying to expand it to financial inclusion by using cards, so move beyond sort of the cash system. Um, now, we've helped expand those to 40 countries, okay? Now, 
coming back to this point, one of the, my conclusions from the past years is every country needs some basic safety net system because we're not going to be able to control food or oil prices or the other things that can hit people. But what we can do is to try to make sure you've got in place something that helps those that are most vulnerable when crisis hits. And so we're doing an inventory of every country and we're trying to figure out, well, if not a conditional cash transfer, can it be a school feeding based system or something like that. And so that's an interaction with the client. It's to show them what's been done, but it's also trying to understand the problems that they see. So client focus. Mm -hmm. um, and then second, uh, I guess, what's been inherent in this, our whole exchange, which is you see the bank as a partner in how do we add somewheres where the support, somewheres where comparative advantage, somewheres we can teach, somewheres we can learn. So a networked model, uh, but that's something that I'm sure that Dr. Kim knew well from his experience. And, but I did, by the way, on the list of items, I did discuss um, civil society groups and foundations. Good. Well, thank you for doing that and really appreciate that handoff as a, as a World Bank president has been so open to this concept of the network world. And I mean, it is interesting when we reflect on the, you know, the, the relevance of the World Bank for years to come. I mean, the, the, the level of capital flows out there um, is, is the core relevance of, you know, resources, knowledge, you know, how does the bank uh, play a, a critical role in what has been a, a really transformative, ongoing transformative portion of human history of such reductions in global poverty as, you know, parts of the global economy have stalled and so forth. So, so where, yeah. where is that, that key well, skill set? Well, it's a great question because, you know, there's still a tendency, and you can see this too in the succession, to sort of evaluate the bank by how much money it's had. Uh, and, and frankly, we've had, a, you know, as I said, a quarter of a trillion dollars is not worth scoffing at. But on the other hand, you know, it's in the larger things, it's still a modest amount. But I sometimes point out to people that one of the problems with understanding the World Bank is it's called bank. And so most people kind of associate banks with lending money, at least they used to. Um, and and um, uh, now they associate with losing money, I guess. Um, uh, but in reality, where the bank performs best is combining innovative finance. We've got some great financial capacities to think about how to do you know, rain index futures mm -hmm. for various areas, try to help with trade finance, leverage all different things. Um, but also to try to combine that with the knowledge and learning from that we generate, that other countries generate, that you generate, and we create various platforms to be able to expand that. But then to try to make investments that expand market institution and capacity. So it's not an individual investment alone, but it's to try, you know, how do you build a system by which others can expand? So it, you know, it may be a carbon market, it may be um, a local currency bond market, it may be microfinance market, it may be um, the capacity in, in a conditional cash transfer system. How do you, in a sense, leverage that to expand it? And so what I would summarize is say we're in the business of development solutions. Mm -hmm. And some of those solutions will come through the private sector, some of them will come with partnerships with civil society groups, some of them helps the government to use their resources better. You know, and, and it varies by country. So uh, I was talking with Donald Kabaruka of the African Development Bank last week, and he brought to my attention that now of 54 sub-Saharan African countries, 46 have proven energy reserves, mm -hmm. okay? So the big issue for many of those countries is how will they uh, how transparent will they be? How will they use it for inclusive growth? How do they avoid corruption? You know, how, um, how do they take care of the environmental issues? How do they avoid Dutch disease with the currencies? And so the bank has to figure out how to have development solutions related to that. Now, I'll give you a very practical example of this. At our, at, I have a morning staff meeting every morning. Uh, so I have all the vice presidents, so regional and functional and others. Um, and one of the things we were talking about was how in some of the post-conflict states that have good mineral resources, they've got big mining companies, but one of the presidents said it's him with the, the mining companies. And so can he get some legal help? Well, we do some of that, but one of the things that we talked about is you know, developing kind of a, a quicker response capacity whether it's you know, a Chinese or European, a US firm, to help a country understand, well, 
you know, what, what should one expect? What are the, no the norms of legal agreements? And then what are the lessons about how you develop this? So um, that's why, again, I'm very suspect of silver bullets, one size fits all. You know, it's, it's the world of development solutions, and we will keep learning how to do that better. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I'd like to, uh, to open it up to our, our audience here, and if, if someone has a question, do, do raise your hand. Please keep it to a question, or if your comments are, are short, uh, fine, but... Uh, Can I make one other comment? Yeah, go it's, ahead. It's, it's, yeah. You know, um, you know, one of the issues I get asked a lot, too, is, well, okay, developed countries are all under stress, you know, they're under, you know, been going through a terrible time. Why does this matter to them? You know, so why right. should developed countries right. contribute to this? Well, you know, one starting point is, you know, two-thirds of global growth over the past five years have come from developing countries. If you'd look at that in the 90s, it would have been in the 20 percent something. So, you know, part of the answer and part of the point I've said is, we're, we're beyond a model of charity to poor people. This is in self-interest because we want to create more poles of growth. We know China's one, Southeast Asia's one, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa's growing five to six percent a year. Um, these provide opportunities to also sell goods, make investments, and so, you know, as the world economy grows, it's going to benefit developed countries. That's one thing. Second, if you don't pay attention, these become breeding grounds of problems. So, you know, whether it's Afghanistan, you know, or that I was talking about with the development, you can't have security unless you figure out some way to have an economy uh, sort of based on it. Um, whether it's based on the transnational spread of health problems and diseases and pandemics or refugees or immigration, you know, you all have the sort of the commonality of, of, uh, of interest. So, it really covers security, it covers economics, it covers the environment, and, you know, if you just take the United States, you know, it's 4% of the world's population, um, you know, 20% or more of the world's economy, you got an interest in what's happening out there, whether it's from your own sense of ethics or whether it's your economic or security self-interest. And so institutions like the World Bank help address some of those problems and help it not only improve the lives for people in those countries, but can thereby come back and help Europe and the United States, Japan, Canada, and others? No, I mean, obviously you're talking to a converted audience in terms of an international audience, this desire to, to link ourselves together and uh, create a, a common good both uh, in the developed world and developing world. So I throw it open to, uh, to a question. If you could raise your hand, identify yourself, and, uh, and don't be shy. I know it's always hard to get the first one out there. Got one over here. Looks like an interaction staff person, which is was not a plant. No, not a plant. This on? Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you so much for your your comments. I'm Ken Forsberg with Interaction. Um, you've obviously had very broad experience, both kind of internationally and and within the U.S. government. And I wondered if you could step back and reflect on what, and as an American. What single change or, you know, two or three changes in terms of our domestic politics you think would make the U.S. a more effective, a more responsible, a better global actor and a citizen? Well, um, I met with Bob Carr in the past week, who's the new foreign minister of Australia, uh, very successful premier of New South Wales, wonderful gentleman, uh, had a strong interest in the United States. And he said uh, his message in Washington was the United States is one budget deal away from being restored on the world stage. Um, and, and, uh, and I think, and he was also saying that some countries in East Asia were saying, look, don't spend your time with the United States. We're going to be the next power, um, you know, so pay attention to us. And it's a challenge for the United States on how to, to deal with that. So, uh, frankly, you know, my feeling is that whether it's a question of the United States' ability uh, to be a strong economy, to be innovative, to support the foreign affairs budget, whether it's security issues, um, it has to start at home. And I think that's a key issue of trying to uh, restore the fundamentals of U.S. growth, which include dealing with the spending and debt and deficit uh, policies. Um, not relying solely on monetary policy, as we've largely been doing, 
um, because if you rely on monetary policy for a long time, you're going to plant the seeds of other problems. But I don't only mean um, the fiscal issues. I, it's also what I find interesting now in my experience with the World Bank is that because I deal with so many countries, there's a lot of innovation going on in developing countries that developed countries should pay attention to. Um, and one of the concerns that a lot of middle income countries have is avoiding the so-called middle income trap, which you get to a certain level of income and growth that tends to slow down. So how do you keep up the productivity? Well, these issues relate to the United States too, in terms of energy policy, in terms of education. The United States puts a lot of money into education schools, but what do we get for it really in terms of overall performance? You know? So these are I infrastructure. Um, you know, when you read about the infrastructure proposals in the United States, they're all still talking about how to use public money. I can't go to a developing country that doesn't try to figure out how to have a public-private partnership for this. So you know, I can go to country, parts of China that will monetize the toll roads, but the state of Pennsylvania refuses to do so. So you've got states that have liabilities, but they also have assets, and they're less open in using those assets than developing countries are. So I guess the basic point for the United States is I think it's got to get its economic house in order, but as part of that, I don't only mean the budget, although I think that's a key part of it. Uh, it also is kind of freeing up some of the ingenuity and entrepreneurialism and drive and building for a next generation. Thank you. Another question. Well, they're all quiet when you, when, you, when, you, when you stump civil society, you know you've yeah, done really a very do. good job. It's funny, in uh, my experience or, with civil society, or, uh, most people are not, they don't know, all sit there quietly. That's, that's good. Right. That's good. So I've got one, one uh, I guess, right, one in the back there, and then we'll move up to the front. Again, if you identify yourself. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, Aaron Chassie from Catholic Relief Services. Uh, Mr. Zelik, how do you address the challenges posed uh, worldwide by neo-patrimonial states? I'm thinking about the article written by Barry Weingast and Douglas North uh, a couple years ago that talked not so much about the rent-seeking state, but rather the rent-generating state. Thanks. Explain it further. Yeah, explain you it further, mind. exactly. Yeah, we may uh, this is, it's, 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 it's it's, it's a political economic system where the state essentially controls access to markets uh, through political patronage. And so it oversteps the political arenas into more the economic and even the social arenas uh, where civil society organizations included are very much tied in this sort of top-down vertical network yeah. of patron-client networks. Yeah, okay. So like the corporatist state coming out of the 20s and 30s. Um, well. Um, let me start out with this. Uh, I think, you know, what we've seen across the development field is um, there have been different approaches in, uh, uh, that have worked in terms of engagement of the state. Um, so, you know, it starts out sort of 19th century liberalism, property rights, contract, basic performance, basic education, services, and others. Um, but uh, obviously there's been models sometimes of, of state-driven development. It gets to very tricky governance issues. So if you look at the history of a lot of state-owned enterprises, say in Latin America, these become patronage, they're not as competitive, they're protected. Um, and they may be a good deal for those who are part of it, uh, but they're not such a good deal for the society as a whole. Um, you know, and here's an interesting issue. You're, you're starting to see in the discussion of Mexico the role of Pemex, you know, which was part of the history and tradition of the Mexican Revolution uh, and the role of the PRI, but the PRI candidate, um, you know, has actually uh, uh, been sort of saying, well, maybe we kind of need to relook at this. Now, and because if you look at the revenues for Mexico, a big share come from Pemex and the, and the amounts have been going down, the performance is worse, the environmental performance isn't as good. On the other hand, you have some state-owned companies like uh, Saudi Aramco or the Malaysian Energy One that are, that actually are run quite well, right? So one of the things that I tried to encourage was maybe to have the Mexicans look at some of the other models, but also whether they might approach um, sort of a change to consider additional role of the private sector. Um, I think what uh, the bigger issue presented by that 
related to civil society is that old corporatist model was almost like a pyramid where everybody has to fit into the system in some fashion. The labor unions are kind of part of it. The, the businesses all kind of have to kowtow to it and so on and so forth. And I, I, I think most experiences is that that wasn't as successful economically and it didn't lead to as free a society. You know? And so um, in that sense, I think you know, uh, the, the need to create more space uh, for individuals, for community groups, and others. It'll be done differently in different societies. I mean, look, I obviously believe in democracy, but even short of democracy, you can have broader participatory systems. There's another aspect that you're I think one will hear more about, and that is kind of the role of state-owned enterprises more generally. And this is a topic some of you may know with China. We produced a report called the China 2030 Report, which is really looking at the changes in China's growth model o uh, over the next uh, decade or more. And frankly, I compliment the Chinese. They've grown 10% a year for 30 years, but they realize that the model that they had coming out of Deng Xiaoping in 78, you know, with, with uh, kind of export and investment-led growth, wasn't going to be successful going forward. So part of what they engage with us on is prompting their own debate in their own political transition about these issues. But once you get these enterprises, the state-owned enterprises, they become interest groups and they've got their own hold and they kind of like the idea that they are given really inexpensive loans and they, they don't dividend things back to the public and they build retained earnings and they have less competitive positions and so on and so forth. So I think um, in some ways it's intellectually intriguing because when you've seen the models of growth in some emerging markets, and some of the difficulties of U.S. and others in the financial crisis, it's a more active debate, but I, I think that over time, it's very important, my view would be that the discussion with civil society rec you know, recognizes um, kind of the, some of the dangers of some of these systems, uh, under what conditions do they work better than others, and also what does it say about the good society in which you want to live in. So, let me give you, again, a Mexican example, just because I think in historical terms. I, I was very active with NAFTA, and one of the reasons that I thought NAFTA was going to be very important was because you could see that the old PRI system in the mid-'80s was breaking up. And I would at least argue that you know, the PRI was a representative of that corporatist, clientist sort of model. And then the question is, where would the pieces attach themselves? The unions, the businesses, the school groups, and others. And for me, NAFTA was much more than a trade agreement. It was kind of the embrace of North America with Mexico. And I don't think it's totally accidental that you then started to move to a competitive democracy. And then you've now, you started to decentralize power to the state level. One of the issues in Mexico is the capacity at the state level. And then, um, you know, what are the roles of the components of that system? This is still a fight in, in Mexico today because with narco traffickers, it's a question of, you know, will they take over the judicial system? Will they take over the local police forces? And so I admire, I think President Calderon and his team have you know, done heroic things in this, but the challenge isn't over. And by the way, if you want to take the typical client system, go down to Central America, and they are much weaker in terms of institutions and capacity, and that's where the drug traffickers will go. And again, just to connect you this to the bank, one of the things we had at a spring meeting um, was, I've worked with Central America a lot over the years, we were bringing together the private sector in Central America and civil society groups and some foundations and some universities to try to, to do, look and deal with the broader question of violence in Central America, which is partly gangs, partly narcotics and others. And I, I don't have the numbers in front of me anymore, but I, we, the population of Spain is about the same as population of Central America. And if you compare the murder rates in these two, it's just like exponential. But part of the message, uh, this was intriguing to me, was this, this group that we started out with was in some ways catalyzed by a school called Incaya, which is a business school in uh, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and it kind of it creates a regional business group. And one of the dean of the business school came to me and said, look, you know, we, we're worried about the public administration in our societies. Can we work with you to help develop the capacity of our governments to deal with these issues? And as you know, sometimes in Latin America and others, the private sector said, you know, we'll stay away as far away from the government as we can. You know, 
it's, it, it's corrupt, it takes our money, we'll build walls, so on and so forth. And I think the lesson that I've seen in Colombia or Mexico or others is th that'll kill your society. So I thought it was a good sign that the private sector business community said, we gotta get into this fight, we gotta get in. And so part of what I was trying to do was to show how we could also work and support. So it's part of the larger aspect we've talked about, about um, you know, private sector is not only the profit-making private sector, obviously, it's the nonprofit too. I think I've got one more question right up here. Um, thank you. Thank you, President uh, Zolik, for the work you've done at the World Bank. Uh, my name is Gabriel Liza. I work for the FAO, and I happen to be from Tanzania. My question to you is on youth unemployment. This week, about 90,000 students will graduate in Tanzania from, uh, from six. About 20% of them might go to college. The rest will probably have no employment or no alternative ways to find jobs. What is the bank doing to advise countries or to advise government? And what can you tell your successor to do when he comes in to deal with the problem of youth unemployment? Thank you. Well, let me start by saying around the world, so not only in Tanzania or in Africa, but in, in countries, uh, developing countries and developed countries, what I find is a huge area of interest is the interconnectivity between education, skills, and workforce. You know, and we're working with a variety of partners to look at this issue. I mean, this is an intriguing one. We, we started with the Islamic Development Bank, part of our broader partnerships, to do research on education and youth unemployment, and we came up with an E for E initiative, education for employment, including how you can do public-private partnerships and sometimes private sector performance, which by the way, it turns out in Malaysia and others, there's a much larger sector of this done by the private sector to help interconnect people. Um, but it's also, of course, talks about the, the education and having the feedback for the schools about what employers are looking for without just making it sort of a narrow training. But the bigger issue, I think, is this. Our next World Development Report, so we've done, the, you know, these are the sort of the landmark reports we try to do to push the agenda. So we, one we did on food, food and agriculture and then gender and the conflict states. The next one is on jobs. And, and it's basically, so this will come out later this year. And just to give you kind of a short form perspective of this, some of the questions it's asking is, I don't wanna reduce this too far, but many of the economics profession would simply say, Jobs is an unemployment issue and it's simply a derivative of growth. You get certain growth, you create the jobs, okay? Um, we're, we're twisting the, the, the prism a little bit and we're trying to say, let's understand the value of jobs uh, from different dimensions. For example, um, individual self-worth, uh, social cohesion, um, broader productivity in the society, okay? So some of these are what economists would call externalities, right? But, and then the question is, as you start to look at the problems from that, what are the gaps? They may be discrimination gaps, they may be institutional gaps, there may be information matching gaps, but what as a, w with policies might you wanna try to do to address those? And then when you think about jobs, it obviously varies by country. And so if you're a country that has large informal sector, if you've got a big agriculture sector, if you're urbanizing, if you're post-conflict, and one of them is youth. And, and I think you know, one of the things that, one, that this study, I, you know, I hope, will come out is to recognize there's a, there's a loss for society as well as the individuals if you don't make special efforts for people at early stages to get engaged in the workforce, to feel that they uh, are learning skills but also a sense of social you know, worth and other aspects. And there are lessons that this is the nice thing about development solutions. We've seen from various countries things you can do that are consistent with markets and incentives, but to encourage them. It may be entrepreneurship. It may be, you know, in some countries, it may be public works programs. You know, it may be different things that allow people to get that transition, but uh, from, from school to, to work to jobs um, in a way that is good for them and good for the society as a whole. So uh, when you ask, what will I do to my successor? I'll say, well, you inherited a good world development report. <laughs> I think as we just sort of wrap up, uh, it's interesting how uh, we tend to look at the world of uh, sort of the glass half full, or what are the problems there? Uh, yeah, economics are sort of often termed as the, the dismal science, but 
perhaps looking at the, the other way from this, well, you know, if you had to sort of conclude, what, what are the bright spots out there? Where, where are the places that we, uh, that we could build on and look at uh, that you think might be the shining spots of uh, both uh, of human prosperity in, in the years to come? Well, at the big level, I mean, think about what we're talked about in development. I mean, think about the fact that, you know, countries that used to be considered as charity cases are now driving the world's growth. This is, this is a huge opportunity. I mean, you know, and it's not only in terms of GDP statistics, but it's in terms of, you know, the individual fulfillment of each of those people. I mean, so, you know, the, the scientists, the engineers, the potential creative entrepreneurs, you know, the, this is an enormous thing and people, if not given an opportunity, so, I, rather than be negative about this, I see huge potential, but you need to keep trying to find win-win solutions. Now, and at the most individual level, I'll tell you what I always find motivating, and I'm sure many of you do, you know, when I work with the very poorest, and I'm, I've had the good fortune of working with a group called the Self-Employed Women's mm -hmm. Association in Correct. India, and it works in South Asia, with I think over two million women, a lot of these women are very, very poor, okay? And they've been given no chance in life. And you just start to see what a little opportunity makes and a little difference makes. And the empowerment of them in terms of whether one of the things we help finance and create credit for was a, a solar lamp and kind of how they help design it so that it can be reading, it can be general lighting, it can uh, help with a cell phone. Um, Within the first week, they make it, they manufacture it, it'd gone out to 10, they'd had over 10,000 sales of this, which again, you know, we helped try to create the basis of financing. And when I talked to, I remember one woman, I, this, it's the poorest of the poor. These are people that would spend eight months a year in salt flats trying to gather salt. And this one woman told me, she said, now because she has a sense of making it different for her children, you know, they leave the children in a village with, you know, grandparents or others so they can start to get an education as opposed to spend the eight months of this. And then you start to, uh, this was very interesting because I was talking with them about a water and sanitation project that, that I was trying to work with the government of India on this. And some of the women started to cry because, you know, this is so fundamental. If they don't have proper sanitation, they're not going to drink and they're not going to eat properly. And, you know, so things that are, at the core of their lives, and with a little bit of support, you can make a difference. And so what I find, mo to be honest, going back to your question about the U.S., it, sometimes I see people in the United States, and you know, to be honest, you know, they got a lot of advantages they don't take advantage of. And, and I see people in poor countries that just give them a little chance, a little chance, and they'll, they'll try to use it. And that's, you know, that's inspiring for people. Well, I'd like to really thank you both for your comments now, but also for the, the leadership role that you've played uh, at the bank, your openness of civil society, and the vision that you have. And uh, really, please uh, join me in thanking uh, Bob Zellick uh, for his leadership and his time. Let me just... Let me close because I know our time is up and uh, you've had a long three days. But I want to thank you for all of what you do because what you can see, and you know, we just touched the surface. You know, what we can learn from, from civil society groups, the information, the ideas, the delivery, um, and as you, you know, uh, is, is enormous. And I know that many of the people in this room make their own sacrifices to do this and you're very committed. And so I want to uh, thank you, but also thank Sam for doing such a great job of pulling such an important group together. Thank you. Thank you.